Hello and welcome to News Click and today we are going to discuss net neutrality, the latest recommendations made by Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. To do this we have Rishabh Bailey with us. Rishabh, you and I have been involved as Knowledge Commons giving various representations on the issue of net neutrality. So are you happy that starting from what, you, what was called the OTT uh, paper over describing the internet as over the top services to what has come now? This two and a half years, I think it started in 2015 to now 2017. Do you see that there has been a distinct shift and an, you know, clarity in what the telecom regulatory authority has now done or is doing? No, there's clearly been a huge change in the way uh, the telecom regulatory authority and the government itself has been looking at the issue of the internet and regulating the internet from back in 2015. At that point of time, the government was primarily concerned based on representations made by the industry, by the telecom industry, who were facing or who, have, who feared losing profits because more and more people were migrating to services like Skype and so on, which they could use to avoid making regular phone calls. Uh, so the attempt then was very much to see whether they could try and bring these internet services under the same regulatory uh, regime that traditional telecom companies have. However, now we see that given this sort of two and a half year process, multi-stakeholder consultation process, the government has actually changed its, its stance in order to recognize the fact that Content on the internet really should not be differentiated based on what it is being used for. And the second part, of course, is that increasingly, voice is looked upon as something which is uh, a legacy service. And really everything <coughs> is becoming, shall we say, digitized and packet based. Mm -hmm. So effectively what you are seeing is that even voice is migrating to essentially the internet as voice over the internet protocol is of course one part of it, but other part of it, for instance, take Geo, which is really converting everything to data packets. And as we know, the back end of all the long haul networks, even for Indian purposes, are again using essentially digital Exactly. Traffic. So it's a recognition that times have changed and that it's no point looking at things from that same perspective maybe. Um, so in that sense, yes, we are, I mean, I am, I am fairly happy with the recommendations that TRI has come up with, which are fairly broad-based and holistic in nature. They, they take a more principled approach to the issue of net neutrality, looking at laying down broad regulatory principles rather than specific rules by which they will regulate the internet. Of course, that leaves space for further rules to be made in specific areas in the future, and there will, I'm sure, be numerous little fights to be had over the coming years. And it's a very distinct shift of focus, shall we say, than what Mr. Ajit Pai seems to be doing for the United States, which is to throw out the baby with the bath water and in fact abandon net neutrality itself from what it appears. And uh, that would essentially mean that at least in India, our regulatory regime is really being aligned to what has been the demand for most of the internet users. It's, it's also interesting because if you look at what happened even in the US when the first uh, rules were passed under the Obama government, the amount of public attention and the involvement of various stakeholders, civil society, various content companies and so on, was one of the reasons oh, it, it created huge pressure on the regulator at that point of time in order to pass rules which were broadly in favor of maintaining the internet as a free and open space, which is the idea behind the internet and which is something that our regulator has also recognized. Here now, however, we have Mr. Ajit Pai, who is an ex-lawyer from Verizon, clearly connected to the industry, who has now gone against this public pressure to say, no, we will do what is right for our big corporations. Do you think we can say that in some sense that neutrality recognizes that internet is playing a public utility function and therefore needs to be really regulated for public good? Absolutely. I mean, that is the crux of the net neutrality debate, essentially, on whether you can privatize bits of the internet and charge money or toll for, you know, accessing these areas or whether it should be a, essentially a free for all with certain regulations and restrictions. Um, and the fact that it is increasingly be used to provide all sorts of services, people are using it to access information, our government is trying to push more and more government programs to it, means it has to be treated as a public utility. Whether you now deem it as important as electricity or water is debatable, but no doubt it is reaching the level for an informed citizen, you have to have internet access now. And if the government wants every banking money transaction to move to the internet, of course it has to 
treated as a public utility, it leaves open the question then do you declare section 144, ban the internet for pre-specified periods and so on, and how do you square the circle of keeping it consistent with the public utility? Absolutely. No, I mean that is a problem that in particularly states like Kashmir and so on where you have blanket bans of the internet. So one is not quite sure how you deal or you square these, these two positions, but no doubt that this is a step forward in ensuring that the internet is gradually recognized, not just as a public utility, but as a right to access. Coming back to the actual recommendations, and as you said rightly, that this is more establishing certain principles and not looking at just rules, because you've established the principles, rules are easier to derive. If you don't, then you can get contradictory rules come in, yeah. and then it becomes very, very arbitrary. And yeah. that was always... And it a provides a certain amount of flexibility to deal with new technological innovations that might occur, or new practices that one might see in the market, as long as it's all specific rules are made to deal with specific situations, keeping in mind the broad principles that have already been laid down. I think that is the attempt of TRI over here, and I think that should be commended. There are two carve-outs which TRI has left into a certain degree open. One is what it calls specialized yeah. services, and in this they have said certain services which use IoT could be specified as specialized services, but the carve-out is very specific. It says that it has to be declared as a special service, and you cannot just on your say-so claim it to be a specialized service. So that is one. Do you think that is a, it's a, a good step, leaves enough flexibility for new technologies, as you say, or new services, as well as maintains that in the name of specialized services, you do not create a yeah. private space? No, TRI, I think, has been fairly clear in saying that specialized services must be specific services which are optimized or which, because of the kind of service it is, that need specific conditions to function. At the same time, they've also been really, really clear in saying that specialized services cannot be a replacement for general access to the internet. Uh, and also that while providing specialized services, you cannot cause harm to the general public internet. So for instance, Facebook cannot now say zero rated, the, the zero rating platform it was running is a specialized service and therefore we will provide this because that's clearly then an attempt to get around net neutrality regulation. They cannot just be normal services which are now moved into a specialized category. And of course, there are specific tools on the internet or specific services which do need you know, very, very quick connections, 100% packet receipt or, or, you know, a high, a high percentage of packet, you, you shouldn't have too many packets dropped and so on and so forth. So no doubt there is a need for this carve out, which is also, of course, useful in the case of, say, public emergencies. If the government itself wants to provide particular services, whether it's education, medicine, so on and so forth. So there is a need for this carve out. And I'm glad that TRI has sort of laid out very clear boundaries for this. What cannot be class classified as specialized services and then exactly. make it compete with the open internet Exactly. Service. And as you were saying, I mean, um, there were some suggestions during the entire consultation process that the internet of things itself should be kept out of the net neutrality framework. And I'm glad, in fact, that the try hasn't. Firstly, the internet of things is a rather nebulous concept. It broadly just refers to every device which has an IP address and is connected to the internet. So as our cell phone. Exactly. The other issue is really content delivery networks. Does it violate net neutrality? And what are the limits of the content delivery networks? Now, for the lay people, content delivery networks are, for instance, Netflix, Amazon, etc., etc., particularly uh, video on demand kind of service. Yeah, so what content delivery networks actually do is if you have a Netflix whose servers are located physically very, very far away from, from the user, it will likely take more time for that content to be accessed. So therefore, you hire services or you hire co-location services which are closer to the user so that the person can access them. I mean, so it's a distributed uh, method of accessing you information. You actually buffer the same thing yeah. in lots of places. Exactly. And what it would mean, for instance, if certain kinds of films are popular in India, they would have local servers catering to that in India. Exactly. While, for instance, Spanish films may be uh, buffered or stored in servers in Latin America, say, yeah. for example. So now, TRI has actually, I think, done reasonably well to exclude CDNs. However, what is interesting, though, is that they do point the need to ensure that there's greater transparency in the CDN market as well. Because right now, no one knows about the sort of arrangements that are 
taking place between service providers and uh, content delivery networks and these sort of providers. So this is basically what would mean then the content, content delivery networks when they interface to the public internet, which is ultimately through which the content really comes to the user. That part of it is at the moment identified as an issue, mm -hmm. but really no, no, may, no del, shall we say, rules have been laid out for that. So that's yeah. sort of an open issue at the moment, because it is possible through the back door, content delivery networks may get privileged mm -hmm. over other services. So that risk remains. But it is good that they haven't taken a decision either way and left this as, as of now. Yeah, as because it, look, as ultimately, uh, the issue also comes down to if I have you know, very, very fast as a service provider, if I have really, really fast servers, which I can afford because I'm a bigger company, I can provide faster services on the internet. Yeah, so this does give an unfair advantage to the YouTubes and the Facebooks of the world. But given the fact that there is uh, this issue that they are today hosting a huge amount of content, therefore this does not seem to be something that we should prevent unless it mitigates against other at the level of certain ISPs privileging. Certain no, so that is exactly the issue. So even CDNs will, I think, ultimately have to be uh, regulated in the sense that they cannot enter into discriminatory agreements with companies. And for the last mile. For the last mile. So that is where I think TRI is coming from when it says that we need more transparency on the agreements that they sign with ISPs because then that then becomes the next step. How do we regulate it once we have this information on the practices that they are actually following? Now, it's also something that we have discussed earlier, which is particularly applicable to the no anti net neutrality positions that, for instance, the US regulator is taking. That ultimately, this issue is that you need larger bandwidths. And the policies should be something which encourages increase augment bandwidth rather than try and ration bandwidth and therefore get the existing telecom operators generate rent from creating Absolutely. scarcity. Creating an artificial scarcity. Artificial scarcity. And that this, therefore, the net neutrality rules, therefore would be in that sense promoting a wider bandwidth generation rather than creating rent incomes through scarcity. At the moment, the, re uh, the recommendations are very clear that traffic management practices must be reasonable, like they must be transient, they must be proportional, and they must be carried out to meet one of the four or five conditions that are mentioned in the regulations to, you know, improve security of the network or for network, you know, uh, management practices, whether it's to deal with a public emergency, so on and so forth. So there are a few things specifically mentioned that they can use it for. Uh, so it's good then, for instance, that they cannot use it now for commercial purposes. It's already taken care of. But however, we will need to see how it is actually implemented in regulation. Also, what will be important is how it is actually monitored and how penalties or punitive action or bans of any kind are enforced at a later stage. TRI has taken a slightly unusual position on this by creating a multi-stakeholder group to make recommendations. And I was actually wondering what your thoughts are on this, particularly in a country like India where you have such vast differences between the various stakeholders. I think it's interesting that they're talking about multi-stakeholders because normally the stakeholders they have respected uh, more than anybody else has been the telecom operators. And I think what they're increasingly realizing that the way this is moving dynamically, particularly based on internet, that that's a very restrictive view of the uh, internet itself. And therefore, they need to have more people come into the room mm -hmm. for the discussions. And I, I have to say that I think the net neutrality debate has also been very important in terms of the public voice, which was, which was at least forced into the TRAI, particularly after the OTT services got a very negative reaction from the people. And after that, the Facebook case, which, uh, as you remember, the zero rating case by which they tried to privatize, if you will, free basics, free basics yeah. issue. And both these did make get the public voice heard. And it was also very clear that the public voice was an aware, technically informed voice. And it was not just creating opposition for opposition's sake. And I think it's that recognition which has driven the multi-stakeholder uh, approach that they have talked about. Two provisions over here. One is that it is possible, as we know very well, the multi-stakeholder process itself 
uh, to be corrupted by co-opting certain kinds of stakeholders and mm. claiming them to be people's uh, representatives. Mm. That can happen even more easily when you talk about uh, public interest groups, because whether they're really public interest or private interest is a okay. difficult question to figure out. The second part of it, I think that we need to also know particularly areas which are technically relatively more complex. Mm -hmm. You talked about traffic management. Now, traffic management is a technically more complex area mm -hmm. than the broad net neutrality debate that we have been having. And we need to see what kind of technical experience, ex expertise the public interest groups will be able to bring into the debate. But I think it's a recognition. And that's what has also uh, really differentiated the TRAI from other regulatory bodies mm -hmm. in India, that they have had much more public consultations than, for instance, the electricity regulator. This has actually been a two-year process with at least six or seven public consultations, various open houses. So in that sense, I think TRI has done a wonderful job in taking the country on board, if I can, you know, be as... And also moving from its initial positions to yeah. the position it has now. And we have to give uh, everybody a pat on the black back, including ourselves, who participate in the process. And we helped, uh, everybody has helped themselves and TRI come to a better understanding of the debate, particularly when it is moving retrogressively mm -hmm. in uh, what many of the Indian tech uh, industry will consider their fatherland, namely the United States. I think this is a really welcome uh, change. Thank you very much, Risha, for being with us. And I hope that you will be appearing for Knowledge Commons, uh, to which we are both parties, on such issues in front of TRI as these things develop. Thank you very much for being with us. This is all the time we had for NewsClick today. Keep watching NewsClick. Also visit our YouTube uh, channel and also visit our Facebook page.